going in the hopes that we can end before 9 p.m. Uh, before getting into the details of the program, I do want to recognize a number of elected officials who are taking time out of their schedule to join us this evening. Uh, first, from our General Assembly, Senator Adam Evan. From our County Board, Vice Chair Jay Fassett. And from our School Board, Vice Chair Barbara Cannonan. From whom you will hear later. And uh, Reed Goldstein. believe that's everyone. So thank you all for coming. Uh, our topic this evening, and from our county board, Chair Libby Garvey. <laughs> so our topic this evening is where will today's elementary students go to high school? Arlington's population of young children is growing. In and of itself, this growth is symptom of good causes. People are drawn to live here. We have great opportunities and they want to raise their children here because our schools are excellent. While Arlington was once seen as a way station on life between college and a big plot out in the suburbs and traffic on I-66, now folks want to stay, want to remain. They're having children and we need to educate their children. We're already seeing the impact of this population growth in our elementary schools. But this evening we're gonna look forward because today's adorable little elementary school children are tomorrow's, let's just call them high school students. Indeed, and not to steal the thunder of our presentation, but according to what I saw in one of the slides, APS is anticipating an approximately 40% growth in our total number of high school students over the next 10 years. Now, when our program committee set out to research this, we thought it would be a pretty straightforward discussion about getting desks and classrooms and where to put these kids and how to structure our schools and our school day. But we were quickly surprised to learn that this local challenge comes amidst a backdrop of new requirements that are changing how high school is going to be. And some might say that we're fortunate to be taking both of these on at once that we can look for options that will solve both of the challenges. Others may say that this overlap is confusing the issues, that viewing the two challenges together muddies the waters, and we need to look at one or the other. My hope with our program today is that listening to and questioning our three speakers will help us have a better sense of how these challenges work together, what is at stake, and then how we can use what we learn to influence decision making going forward. Before I introduce our speakers, I do want to offer a bit of historical context. And that is to note that these challenges are not new and they're not unique to Arlington. In fact, when I was in high school, some 20 years ago in a suburb of New York City, our school district faced a similar capacity crunch. Now, this stands out in my memory only because at the same time, my English class was reading Jonathan Swift's famous, or perhaps I should say infa infamous, Modest Proposal. And we were assigned to write modest proposals of our own dealing with a contemporary problem. And I chose the solution for Oceanside school capacity as my modest proposal. So, while we may not like all the ideas we hear this evening, it is worth bearing in mind there are other options. So, where will our elementary kids go to high school when they become teenagers? How will they go to high school in the 2020s and beyond? We're fortunate to have three speakers who will take this on from different angles. First up, we'll hear from Chris Ditta, the president of our Arlington County Council of PTAs, affectionately CCPTA. Um, he previously served Barcroft Elementary as amongst others, and I had to shorten this for time. PTA Vice President, CCPTA Rep, Webmaster, Track Construction Fundraising Chair, Student Buddy Mentor, Harris Teeter Fundraising Liaison, and a member of the Principal's Advisory Council. And 
lest we think he's only hanging out at Barcroft, he served the APS Arts Advisory Committee, the Superintendent's Advisory Committee on Technology, the Kenmore Middle School CCPTA rep, um, and, and I think, again, that, that we've gone on for quite a bit. Chris and his wife, Jenny Donaldson, have two children who have attended APS, and he's going to provide a bit of a parent community perspective for us. We'll then hear from two representatives of the school system itself. First, Patrick Murphy is our superintendent of schools, has held that role since July of 2009. Now, remember, he came and spoke with us, I think, right after taking that role. Uh, he was selected as the 2015 Superintendent of the Year by the Virginia Association of School Superintendents and was a finalist for National Superintendent of the Year. Um, since joining APS, Dr. Murphy has focused on academic rigor and academic and course planning. He's an instructional, instructional rather, leader and advocate on the mission to eliminate the achievement gap for all students. We welcome Dr. Murphy. And then finally bringing up the uh, rear, last but not least, Barbara was elected to the Arlington School Board in 2014. Uh, she currently is vice chair PhD in environmental economics. She's a children's book author, um, not on econometrics. Um, and a school community leader has served on a number of boards, including the Early Ch Childhood Advisory Committee, the Math Advisory Committee, and the Advisory Council on Instruction, and currently serves as liaison to the Budget Advisory Committee. Uh, she and her husband, Kevin Wolf, have two children who have attended APS. And we'll be able really to speak to that unique perspective that school board members have as both members of the community and part of the school system. Well, enough for me, lots to discuss tonight. So with that, please join me in welcoming Chris Ditter from the CCPTA. Thank you, Scott. I'm not typically a public speaker, so bear with me as I mumble and say um a lot and all the things my daughter tells me is wrong. Um, I have a 14 year old at freshman at Wakefield and I have a nine year old who's in fourth grade uh, currently at Rivendell Elementary School on the highway. Um, I define where will today's elementary students go to high school as um, how will today's elementary students achieve an optimal high school experience? So I'm looking at not from a, you know, bricks and mortars, but from a, um, from a, from a going forward perspective, um, how will they, you know, be better people? So I'm going to give you a little bit about what CCPTA does, the County Council of PTAs. I'm going to talk about student life, today's experiences, and then I'm going to talk about uh, factors influencing high school readiness. As I mentioned, I'm the president of the CCPTA. I've been doing it for a couple of years now, um, through next year. Um, we exchange ideas and information um, across uh, all the PTAs in the county. We have 30 to 40 uh, different uh, schools come to our meetings, uh, closely with the administration at APS and the uh, school board. And we, but we also feature a lot of community involvement. So that's where a lot of the discussion will be as well in terms of how we grow as individuals. Um, we have monthly meetings the fourth, uh, the fourth Monday of the month. Um, our biggest events are art reflections in January and a scholarships event in uh, June that we um, partner with other um, uh, groups in the county. Our goals, um, and on the right you can see um, the leadership that we um, in, uh, work with, the board that I work with. Every one of those um, are uh, parents from students. Some have graduated from the school system. Some have early kids, early education kids. Um, our goals this year are about building effective partnerships, um, learning uh, uh, from each other, um, finding success. Finding success for all students is very difficult sometimes on an individual basis. So that's something important to us. And um, we've been, last year we did a lot of spotlight on solutions. I'll pop that in the next slide. But this year we want to focus on measured outcomes. Every month we have a monthly theme, and what we've done over the course of time is to focus on many different opportunities and different thoughts of what's happening out in the community from a parent and student perspective. And um, whether it's the whole child, the arts, and you can see the list there. Um, but we do talk a lot about uh, graduation requirements, and we get feedback from the county as well. And you'll see some of the topics there. It just gives you an idea of the breadth of the topics we uh, discuss on a monthly basis. Notice boundaries is down there for 2017, 2016. 
All right, now we get into the subject matter here. Um, the important thing for students that I'm finding, now that I have a ninth grader, um, has to do with fit. Who am I as a, as a child? Um, who am I as a student? Who am I as a person? And you know, we all go through that. We've all been there. But the objective for the school system, I think, is, a, is personal growth and helping them achieve the um, best they can. So the challenge to optimal high school experience is many things. To in, in, um, they're trying to fit in the world. Um, they have socialization issues. They have um, a question as to who can guide them to where they could be better in life. And so they're looking for their schools many times and their friends, sadly, um, for guidance and, 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 a, and a pursuit of where to go next. So I'll give you a little feedback on um, classroom versus extracurricular. My daughter is a, you know, has the AP classes. She's got the intensified classes. She is uh, pushing the envelope on, you know, what she can be in terms of the best um, classes uh, that are available to her. She's at Wakefield, right? She could have went to IB. She took the test for um, Fairfax um, uh, Science Technology. Um, we decided this was the best fit for her just because of the personality of the, of the school and the people at Wakefield. Um, but she's also an artist, she's also an actress, she's also a kid that plays multiple instruments. And because she's having three to four hours of school, of homework a night, there's that balance. How do you balance that? So this is a little different from, is the school big enough? Is it supporting her? But now we're talking about how they're supporting her. Um, and that's where I want to get to a little bit. When she was choosing the school, um, we thought about IB. We thought about um, what would be best for her, but we really never knew until she started. She's been in there a month or two. She's already changed out of some classes. She's already, you know, cried multiple nights, you know, about the stress. Um, this is what a student's going through, you know, and they're not the only one. This is just my daughter. Um, I've spoken to hundreds of families, um, and I even talked to students as well. And not everybody's experiencing the same thing. Some are just skating through and happy-go-lucky and just skipping along, and that's probably 70% of the kids. So I, I saw those kids too, and they're very much happy with what, they've, what they're doing. So the ones that are also pushing the envelope, and they're making do with what they have as well. The biggest challenges they're seeing, though, is pleasing the, the teachers, um, fitting in in the school. Um, what's the environment like there? Can they fit walking down the hallways without getting run over? Um, what's, those are the things that are the challenges. Um, one other example is um, distance learning. Um, that's a good example of how to give kids opportunities for classes throughout the um, county. Well, in this case, it's not the best situation for some kids because they need to have interaction with teachers and it's not always the same. Um, so that's a program we need to do better at, I think. I'm gonna go down to uh, student stress. Um, Standardized testing requirements are part of the need of the of the schools. Um, you know, I'm I'm I, my background is private school. I was in private school my whole life, um, so I have a different perspective coming down here from New York. And one of my challenges has been how do you fit with the public school system, which is one of the best in the country. And it truly is. I mean, there's, there's so many options, so many opportunities. How do you get the most out of it? Um, and let's go to the next page. So let's focus on helping students achieve that optimal school life balance. Um, can we reduce unnecessary testing? Um, can we make homework more outcome driven versus busy work? Because there's a lot of that as well into the program. Um, the students are in school 35 hours a week, but they're doing 18 hours of, of homework a week as well, or 20 hours or 30 hours. Um, does anybody here work 60 hour work breaks like I do or just, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but at 14 we are doing that, you know, so probably not. Um, that's the question, you know, what's the, what are we pushing them for? Um, simplified diploma is a, is a topic I think is important as well. Um, I want the schools to align with college entrance requirements and make that clear for the students because they do have that hanging over their heads as well. 
Where am I going to go to college? What's my future like? Where am I going to be? Because they're, it's being driven into them at an early age that that path to, uh, to the better place needs to be you know, started now. Um, they're not focusing on go play outside and go join the team. And, um, and that needs to be part of that uh, balance. Um, I think what's happening right now in the county and my experiences with the uh, tech center, with um, the technology devices that are being used, I think a lot of that can be really pushed to the next level. Um, but there's actually something interesting I want to get to, which is not in my slides, but I was given a brief on today. And I have about a minute or two left, so I want to make sure I cover this. The ACI, which is the Arlington, um, I'm sorry, the um, uh, Advisory Committee on Instruction, is talking about um, different types of models for high schools. And they've given a list out of the different types that are being looked at as to what would be a good way to really build um, a school. And they talk about a ninth grade academy, which I think is great because the ninth graders are not yet socially ready, I think, for a lot of the things they're seeing. So my daughter's an August kid, so that's a bad example, but um, they're all trying to do you know, things that 18 year olds want to do. I've seen that from the homecoming dance this past weekend. Um, yeah, you should have seen the videos, it was really interesting. Um, but there's also a creative and performing arts kind of concept. There's a, a business high school, early college high, expanded HB program, because I think HB does a great job of uh, building uh, individuals. Um, high school academy and high school in the high tech high. Um, there's high school hubs, I don't know much about that, but I'm sure we might get a question about that later. Um, IB World Language Center, International Business School, um, an online high school diploma. I think that could be rather valuable. I know my daughter did a lot of work in um, looking at Khan Academy and different other venues to get knowledgeable, to be ready for the next uh, level of grades. Um, and then of course STEM and science focused um, high schools. I think there's something very important to say um, at the end of this is that we need to build a school that envelops all the aspects of the child not just whether they're mapped correctly around the county, but that they can go to where they can um, fit in best, and what's in their interests. So I just want to thank you for being here. All right, thanks, Chris. We'll now switch from the parent view to the school view. and Welcome up, Dr. Patrick Murphy. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to move around uh, as a result of my uh, background and experience as a classroom teacher. So uh, hopefully um, I'll be able to keep up with the mic. Let me lay out a few things in relationship to what Chris has shared uh, to give you a bit of a context and then I know Dr. Cannon is gonna come and build on that. The first thing that I'd like to uh, pass along to you is a vision. Because we've gotta have some type of vision as far as where we're going and how we're gonna get there. In 2009 when I came on board, and became a little bit more familiar with the community, one of the things that I heard about Arlington was choice. Choice was a big uh, word then, it still is big today, but choice for me really spells the idea that Chris talked about, and that's providing opportunities for kids. When we provide opportunities for kids, it paves a path for their future for choices. And if we keep those two things in mind, creating opportunities that give students choices today, tomorrow, and out into their life, that is the path that we need to follow. I say that another way, and that is we've got to keep hope alive for our kids. And we've got to show them that there is a way to succeed, and we've got to be able to support them in that, in that journey. And we do a very good job of that. But as Chris has said, there are different paths to success, and there is not just one static path that in the past we've become familiar with. There's another element here that's at play, and that's accountability. And we, having lived here all my life, are very familiar with what's happening with federal accountability in relationship to public education. But we also see that at the state level, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. But as far as dynamic, there's been a huge shift from a standardized test-based accountability to something that's more reasonable and it's beginning to evolve. 
I think that's a large piece that plays into all of this. And then finally, the enrollment. In other words, things are changing. <coughs> things are going to continue to change. Life is going to look different. But one of the messages we want to convey to you tonight is, and you've got that in front of you, there is a plan. We know how this is going to play out. We've got the, the preparation in place. Is it an absolute? Is it you know, going to work perfect? No. You develop plans to then modify and adjust them. And so this was something that we've worked on for the last six months. And it talks about all of the elements of our strategic plan, from the academic elements to the human resource elements and then to the facility. But I think one thing that we've emphasized is instruction needs to lead as far as the teaching and learning process, but also coupled with that, the decisions we make. So one of the speakers has also said, it's kind of a convergence of multiple issues simultaneously. The last piece that I will share with you, and then I'll uh, move through these slides relatively quickly, is workforce becomes critical. And that's playing itself out here, especially in our county, as we look at maintaining and developing a workforce that is going to be here. And that builds on opportunities and choices for children in the future. We have some very strong sectors here in this region of the, uh, of the, um, you know, the nation, but we need to flesh those out and we need to continue to develop those. That is premier on my mind. When I think about our graduates, how are they going to move into the workforce? It is not an absolute in life that you simply go on to college and then maybe come home to live in your parents' basement. We need to prepare kids for something much more beyond that so they have choices. And those choices may be to move immediately into the workforce and then later move on. And some of the other options might be to go to the community college. Higher education has become very, very expensive today. So how do we prepare our kids uh, for those things? So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about high school redesign, then Dr. Cannon's gonna come up and talk to you about a little bit about our plan, piggybacking off on the uh, document that was hand, just handed out to you. You, me, may have come up under a, um, a system where content was king, right? Learn your facts, be able to uh, regurgitate them. No simple memorization. In looking at what a profile of a graduate is gonna need to look like, and this is something that the state is looking at, they recognize that career exploration, and by the way, this is not just for high school students. This is gonna become embedded across the curriculum K through 12. So at, we look at career exploration, workplace skills, and community engagement and civic responsibilities. All of these elements kind of converge into one. And so how students use and apply their knowledge and skills becomes very critical to when they exit as a, um, as a graduate. There's also coupled with that the fact that there's a real strong sense around critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, and citizenship. And while that's a strong element, the element of citizenship here, colleges and universities, employers are looking today, how are you giving back to the community? How are you contributing to the wealth of the whole society? Coupled with that, we don't work in isolation anymore. We're on teams. We're collaborating with people that are either present in the room or outside the room. And so we need to begin to develop these skills um, and have students feel comfortable uh, with them. My big push, and you'll see, is also developing these internships and experiences that students have hands-on, where they're integrated into the workforce. So as I've uh, pleaded with different groups or expressed an interest, if you're an employer, and you'd like to have interns or want to offer experiences, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. If you know of someone that would like to uh, have student interns, we're expanding that and we see that as a real benefit, not only to our students, but also to our community. So, 
One of the elements of the high school redesign that is being talked about at the state level is that of students using applied knowledge and skills. We were fortunate to share this with the Virginia Department of Education. And the next clip I'm gonna show you is actually a project that is going on right now at Wakefield. It's been going on actually for the last 17 years. The state was very interested in our project. Uh, it is very, what I would say, mature. But this can give you an idea of those type of experiences that could become part of a diploma requirement. So let me play this clip here for you. All right, we'll move on. I'm sensitive to, uh, sensitive to our time. Uh, one of the elements of the, the senior project is the students endeavor in a variety of different things. It could be community service, it could be research, it could be as, uh, one of the projects, the students uh, overhauled an, an engine uh, for one of their vehicles. So in other words, there's a broad uh, you know, breadth of different experiences that they endeavor in, but it's also of their particular interest. And so how do these experiences then, whether they're working with uh, another mechanic, whether they're working with civic groups, whether they're giving back in some way, or whether they're doing research, they then have the requirement to, to turn around, and you saw that, to go back out and present this after a year-long project. That's one example of how the high school requirements could look or change. Our two other high schools, as an example, Washington Lee and Yorktown, have similar experiences where at the end of the year the students go into the community and do some type of civic activity. So while there are different models out there uh, that can be part of these future diploma requirements, we are actually in a good position, I think, for us to be able to be moving forward. This, this gives you kind of a timeline uh, for these new graduation requirements, and what they highlight is the class that is entering in the fall of 2018 will fall under those new requirements. There's gonna be a reduction in testing, which I mentioned in the beginning with the kind of the federal pushback. They're also going to be looking at alternative or performance-based assessments. Uh, and I think this gets really to some of Chris's point about what are we, how are we determining success? It's no longer what you score on a test or what a particular outcome is. It's really looking at individualizing that or personalizing the program so the students can find their own path and be successful. And not all aspects of this are driven or the ultimate goal to go, go to college. That may be something that they want to look at further down the road or at another time in their life. And it speaks to ultimately choices. Um, I've, I've kind of talked uh, uh, about the various options here that we have. Uh, the one in particular that I just want to highlight is that of Arlington Tech. That is a new program, by the way, that is a program that is also uh, gives kids the choice once they graduate to either go forward into, right into college, they will earn an advanced diploma, or the choice to go right into workforce because some of the experiences they are having there is they are earning CTE or dual enrollment credits, so they have the choice uh, of an either or. And I do wanna highlight the fact that it is um, an advanced diploma program. And so then, how do we begin to talk about looking for the seats for our current elementary students as they um, matriculate through the system? Let me give you just one more fact, and I know Dr. Cannon is coming up as I've run out of time. We are exiting classes when I got here of about 1,200 students. Those classes today are around 1,400 students. We have classes entering, though, through the fifth grade of 21 to 2,200 students. So if you look at that kind of across a continuum, you can see this wave coming in this direction of those 2,200 students as we flake off these classes of 12 to 1400. And what Dr. Cannon is gonna to talk to you a little bit about is what steps we've prepared out in the next several years to make sure that we've accommodated for those students coming in. So, uh, 
thank you to Sharon and Scott for recommending this topic for the evening's discussion. Thank you all so much for coming out. Um, certainly the growth of our schools is a well-known phenomenon in Arlington at this point. It's a subject of anxiety for some. Um, or I believe the school board, my colleague Reed Goldstein is here, the school board and our administration, I would say this is truly a topic of great passion for us. We talk about and think about where students will learn, what they will learn, how they will learn every single day. Um, and we are so, we're very excited about the prospects of what we have um, as part of our plan, as Dr. Murphy referenced. And I hope to convince you tonight that we do have a plan, and this doesn't need to be a subject of anxiety for those of you in the room who have elementary school uh, children or even younger, and I heard there are even some grandparents of elementary school students in our audience. We are, our school board, our administration, our teachers and principals, we show up every day because we all believe in kids. Believe in young people. We know that preparing them for work, for participating in the community, all of that is tremendously important, not just for those individuals, for those kids and their families, it's important for our community. And this being Arlington, it's not just important for our community, we know we export great students and um, young professionals out um, into the rest of the country and even across the world. We think big in Arlington. We know we're preparing young people to be leaders and teachers and professionals and to do great things for all of us. So we take that vision very, very seriously. I believe we're all passionate about it. And most importantly, for those of you who are feeling anxious, we are organizing we have a plan. And I hope uh, that, that you will be convinced of that when I get finished this evening. I want to start, though, I'm going to talk about the bricks and mortar part, which I know you're all excited to start seeing what we're doing in Arlington to make sure that there's a place for all of our students, um, especially in high school, to have a seat. But before I get to that, I do want to uh, tell a little bit about my personal perspective. I have uh, been parenting in Arlington Public Schools for the last 15 years. To give you a quick view of the length of time, uh, the second week of my older son's kindergarten year was 9-11. So if you think, you all can picture that in your mind, that's the length of time I've been parenting in our schools. My youngest son is now a senior in high school. When you get to be, and I've now been parenting in high school for seven years. So when you're a high school parent, and especially, as you're gonna you look forward to this, when you have someone who's about to graduate, you do a lot of things. And you do it on a couple of levels. You do it on a sentimental level, and you do it on a practical level. So sentimental, of course, you pull up those uh, photos of the first day of your child's kindergarten class. And it's really interesting to look at those young people that, um, that are now in your life and think about those photos and who you thought they were going to be and who they are. My oldest was a baseball player. We thought he was going to be a lawyer. He is now an ultimate frisbee playing talented videographer who studied civil engineering in college. My younger son, we thought he'd be a classics professor. He loved the, all the Greek and Roman and the lightning thief and some of those new novels that reference that stuff. Uh, he is now an ultimate frisbee player also. He writes fiction and he's thinking about going into physical therapy. Not even a field that would ever entered our own minds, my husband and I, about what he might want to do or anything that we ever really exposed him to because it wasn't even part of, of, of our professional lives. What's important about that is they discover who they are and their talents and their interests because of our own schools. And when you're a parent, you want to think about did they become, who did they become, how did they become that, and most importantly, did they become the best versions of themselves that they could be. And I know that I can say yes in my children's case. They're not perfect people. We've had struggles. We have to work with the schools in a number of different ways. But at the end of the day, they are now the best young people they were meant to be. And it's nothing like what we thought they would be 15 years ago. You also think on a very practical level. Are they ready to go to college? Are they ready? Do they have job skills? Do they have marketable skills, technical skills? Have they? developed a creative interest that will give them that outlet so that they can drive on a personal level going forward? Do they have a physical activity so that they will be healthy? Do they know how to be healthy? Have they had a mentor? 
who's talked to them about how important they are, how much they like them, and given them ideas about what they might be able to do. And are they comfortable socially? These are the things that you worry about as a parent that you want to see. And again, what's important is this is the package that we provide our own public schools. And the point of that is that is what a seat is in our own public schools. It is so much more than a physical seat. And most of that is also not measurable. It's not the stuff we get judged on at the state level or the federal level. That's what we do in Arlington because we all believe in kids. And you all, as part of this community, have been supporting us. Because I know that you believe in that vision as well. And we thank you for that. So I now have five minutes to walk you through everything that we're going to do to make sure there is a physical seat for our students. Um, and then we'll, I know, have time for questions and conversation after that. Yes. I know this is not readable, but you have, this is a, this is a, just a physical picture of what you've been handed out. This is a three- and five-year plan for Arlington Public Schools. And what's important to show you on that, we're not going to walk through this at all. This is, as Dr. Murphy pointed out, to show you that we have many layered plans to address students and instruction on all sorts of levels, from support to um, extracurriculars. We have the important glue that keeps our schools running and works with our children on a day-to-day -day basis, which is the teachers. I know we've got some in our audience today. That's, that's the light blue section. This is a little uh, 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 physical uh, picture that you can see a little better. We've got the work on students, we've got staff, and of course this green part on the bottom is all of our plans we have to uh, produce learning environments, physical seats, as well as um, other types of learning opportunities for our students. So this is the part that I'm going to focus on. It's the bottom row of the inside of that handout. And again, that, that handout is for you to study to the extent that it interests you. And of course, please feel free to ask any questions, whether tonight or as a follow-up. This is also a slide that I know you're not going to be able to study carefully. This is to show you how many projects we have in the pipeline. The top several rows are um, capital projects that have been in the works and were fully funded in previous capital improvement plan years, meaning 2014 and earlier. Under the blue line are all the projects that we have in our current 10-year plan, our current capital improvement plan that we passed um, this past spring. And I'm actually going to show you pictures of most of these uh, projects very quickly. I know Scout's going to be waiting for the timing, kind of pretty soon. Um, so several of the projects, just to give you a sense of what we're trying to, what, what we're doing in our high schools. So the first piece are internal modifications. We have about 1,900 to 2,000 students in each of our high schools in Arlington right now. Um, you may know that teachers teach five periods out of the seven in the school day. That means that when they're not teaching, traditionally they have their classroom to work with their students, great papers, <coughs> prepare for the next classes. That's not using classrooms as in, in the most efficient way they can be used. Classrooms are meant to be used for teaching students. And so we can move to a 7 7 model where classrooms are used every period of the day by giving teachers other places in the building where they can productively do that work. We've done it at Washington Lee. We're going to do it at Wakefield this coming summer and Yorktown the summer after that. When all is said and done, each of those high schools will comfortably accommodate 2,200 students. Um, this is a very quick uh, map of what Shelby Bell looks like. The yellow or orange uh, sections there are the new teacher workspaces that have been produced. I, I liken them to some of those sort of frequent flyer airline uh, lobbies where you've got lots of different places, sofas, work, private workspaces, lockers, lots of different places that you can go and work and meet with students. So that's been a very efficient uh, way of expanding capacity right in the buildings that we have already. Um, here's a list of a few of the things that we've done recently. So Arlington Community High School, that's the former Arlington Mill, that was able to move, we were able to move that this summer into the Fenway building. That's the building next to the Career Center, and it's now been renovated to be a school building that accommodates the 300 students at Arlington Community High School. By moving them out of the Career Center building and doing some work internally, we have expanded the, the capacity in the Career Center where we are starting to build up the Arlington Tech program that Dr. Murphy referenced. Um, that expanded that space by an additional 300 students. We also have in our CIP plans to build a facility that will um, accommodate 1,300 high school students. That is, we are going to plan what that is. We don't have this, the place necessarily, but we're looking at using the Ed Center space. Um, 
our current staff is going to be moving over to the Sequoia Plaza, called the Cypax uh, building, and we might use that space. But we were also talking to the county board about whether there are other ideas for where we could be building these seats. But we do have the finances in our plan to build 1,300 seats by September, fall of 2022. I'm going to run you through some pictures just so you can get a real physical sense of what we have been doing. Not all of these are high school, but what's important is that we're actually producing seats at every level because we have growth, of course, at every level. This is Discovery Elementary, just opened in September 2015, last fall. This is an addition at McKinley Elementary School, adding 241 new seats. This is going to, this is, uh, going to be completed uh, this winter, and the students will be moving right in after, uh, after their break. Abingdon Elementary, Abingdon Elementary has had a renovation as well as an addition of 136 new students. Stratford Middle School. This is a new middle school where H.P. Beaumont has been located uh, on Old Dominion. Uh, it is going to accommodate 1,000 middle school students. There's a new addition piece on the end of that white piece. That's going to be new. That's going to open in September 2019. Wilson is a building in Roslyn where the old Wilson School was. We are going to be building a modest sized new building there to how the HB Woodlawn program as well as the Stratford program. And that's a modest sized building. Um, and what's important about that is we are taking back a space that wasn't being used currently for a public school. So it's a very good use of space. There was a large community process with um, a number of citizens and civic associations um, that really talked about how to build the right type of building for that space. And um, this, is the, this is what um, really worked with that space that the community uh, recommended. And it's going to be a beautiful also opening in the fall of 2019. This is the new elementary school. Uh, we just approved the schematic design at our last board meeting. This is going to house 750 elementary students um, next to Thomas Jefferson Middle School. In the okay, uh, just very quickly, I'm going to run you through. You're not going to you're not going to see all these numbers, but I just want to show you overall pre K through grade 12. We right now um, have about 26,000 students. We're going up to almost 30,000 students. Our plan keeps up with that growth overall. We're addressing 98% of our student needs within five years, 99% within 10 years. Here it is for um, elementary, 95% by uh, within five years, 100% of our elementary school seats within 10 years. Middle school, 98% within five years, 96% um, in 10 years. High school, we're actually over capacity in five years with our plans and 100% uh, in 10 years. Uh, the last thing I want to mention to you, you got the uh, handouts about our school bond. You just saw all the pictures. This is on the ballot in November. Um, I showed you all of our projects on this specific, this, this bond is going to fund that Wilson School that I showed you. It's going to fund the Stratford edition that you saw. It's going to fund the expansion of the Career Center to accommodate Arlington Tech. Um, and it's going to fund planning for um, the new 1300 high school seats. I do want to acknowledge Peter Fallon, who is right here. He is one of our, our co-chairs for the school bond campaign, and I know uh, he wants to let you know that we have the art signs in case you want to take one home and support the school bond. So that's it. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Um, to remind you that it is the grand tradition of the Committee 100 that we are using our Q&A to seek information, so please ask your question in the form of a question. Additionally, because I did promise the group that we would not run long, please keep your questions brief and please keep your answers brief. All right, who has questions? Now, I know from housing studies that 
as the building goes up, once you've got an elevator building, it gets cheaper and cheaper the more floors you add. Why is it that we can't make that building to house either two H.P. Woodlawn programs or all those other choices that you spoke about? of buildings and the density and such that that type of building that is being built there was the appropriate one for the space you know Arlington takes that community planning and physical planning very seriously um, so that was one piece of it was that that was it's really hitting the recommended size for that site um, there was a lot of concern among parents when there was a proposal at one point to build a middle school there and it would have been much bigger and taller and there are a number of reasons that parents are very concerned about that I think that probably influenced the thinking in terms of how what type of building should go there um, and uh, at the end of the day it's uh, you know it's, it's housing two strong programs that um, you know are the size they are HB is actually going to grow from the size it was before up into, into seven, 700, 725 students for HB Woodlawn um, so at the end of the day, uh, we're accommodating very strong pro two very strong programs, um, and it's it's a plan that, that fits that physical site. Questions, uh, Katie. There's a lot of talk about the number of seats. How are we going to get the seats? I think what is the forefront on everybody's mind now. I am a graduate of Arlington County Public Schools. Wakefield served me well. And um, back then, and even today, there are children sitting in those seats who do not live in Arlington. Could we maybe create a, a seat for a child in Arlington by getting the kids who live in Prince George's County and um, Prince William County out of the seats that they're sitting in and sending them to their local public public schools. When I came here in 2009, that was a uh, very hot topic as far as uh, looking at the number of students who may not reside in, in the county and who may be attending our schools. Uh, there has been, what I would say, a very aggressive approach with that to the point that we have uh, identified folks that don't live here or are not residents, and it's something that all of our principals are mindful of. So part of that is, might be a myth, but part of it, part of it has been addressed, and my comment on that always is, if you know someone who is not a resident, then we will pursue that and take action and we have evidence of doing that over a period of time here in the last several years. I do want to make a note though, and um, it's a balancing act. Uh, just because someone may arrive at a school with a license plate that is not a Virginia license plate does not necessarily mean that they are not a resident of Arlington. So there is a balance and a sensitivity that I know I have and I know the board has but when we become aware of someone who may not be a resident, we come at it very objectively, and then we try and work with those families. If they're not, we want to make sure they transition back to their schools, and we try and facilitate that as well. I can talk a little bit about that too from my personal experience with families that have shared their horror stories of being ejected out of the county. And you know, you've got some families in the county that don't necessarily have a home that they live in every day because they have financial problems or they're living with one family member or another family member, they're, you know, they, they move around. And so when they get selected to be shifted out, 
because they're temporarily with grandma, you know, while something's being worked out in their mom and dad's home, or their mom's home only, or their grandma's home. It gets to be difficult. And I know that the kid's been in that class or that school for four years, and then it's time to say, well, you hit the list. That's been some hardships for the family, so I've experienced that in the family as well. Alexander? Okay, so I'm very glad you brought up that question, just because we talked about it a lot at our executive board meeting um, about uh, housing parents, house, uh, our children who don't live in the community going to our schools. And that was a big concern that I was supposed to bring up. Um, another thing is the fact about um, the change of boundaries and how that is um, going about in community engagement and grandfathering in those people who either have kids in the system, plan on having kids in the system. I know the county changed the roles back in the day about you know all your kids going into one school. Um, and so I think a lot of people are having concerns about that and about the education system that they're going to experience based on that. Um, uh, and one more point would be, I really love your comment, Patrick, earlier about um, getting our kids prepared to not live at home when they're in their 20s, because that is a big concern of mine. I, I you know, my kids are four and two, and you know, I'm thinking now that I don't want to pay for them living in my basement. Um, so those kinds of thoughts and those kinds of um, questions and concerns are, I think, not just hit me, but hit a lot of people and families. So those were my few commentaries. I'll go first as far as just boundaries from my family's experience. Um, a lot of people have reached out to me in the last few months about the, what's happening, how am I going to get impacted, what's the, um, what can we do about it? And, you know, from a MAPS standpoint, there's little because I think you need to fit people into the schools and figure out the right balance. But I think from a subjective standpoint, it goes kind of back to where we were with um, bus transportation a few years back, where you know some of the kids were you know having to walk across you know major highways and different things, and the county really responded well at that point. It took a few weeks to get it right, but I think the, the point there is they responded well, um, not that it was not done right the first time. And I think that's what they've been open about, you know, with us. So the boundaries, I think you have to look at that as well. I think when I was talking before about, you know, focusing on the educational outcomes of the schools rather than the boundaries where you live, that would be a nice thing to see in the future. And I, I would just like to jump in here with the reality of we have great schools here in this county. All of our schools are great. They provide different opportunities for kids, but the reason they're great is because of the teachers that we have in classrooms and the talent that is there that fosters student success. That's the rock bed right there. As long as we can continue to attract talented teachers who work collaboratively with students, we're gonna continue to soar. But I also wanna give a backdrop to some of this while we don't like change, and I, I recognize we all sort of uh, fall prey to that as human beings. The reality of another picture that I could paint, and we always, hindsight is always 2020, is why didn't you make a decision to make some adjustments today, Pat, when maybe four years down the road, we've got 15 or 20 relocatables sitting outside of Washington Lee, and we're endeavoring in a construction project at the Ed Center. There would be some criticism then about you should have made some proactive decisions earlier. So um, it's not sometimes a perfect science, but I think we have to forecast out and how we can be proactive. And I think the board and I think staff have been very proactive. You know, there are several examples, this being uh, the most clear one this evening. And if I could, I'm sorry, I know you want to get to more questions, but I, that's an excellent point. I, I just want to say if, if the school board would not be comfortable with the boundary changes we have coming up if we didn't know what Dr. Murphy said, that every school is a great school. And as we do have to shift students around for the benefit of all of our schools, um, you know, we know that they're all going to end up at a great school. We are just to, so that everyone knows, because we do believe it's most important for everyone to, just to see this, this uh, stuff coming as early as possible. We're doing high school boundaries right now 
we are going to do middle school boundaries as the new middle school opens up. We're going to do elementary boundaries as that new elementary school I showed you opens. Then we're going to do high school again in around 2020. Um, so this is just the reality of Arlington. We have a lot of students. Our schools are filling, and some of our schools are too full. And you know, shifting students around is a reality. We are very, I think, uh, sympathetic as a board to the sibling preference idea that families do um, thrive best when students are at the same school, and that's certainly um, a factor that we're considering in this boundary process. We only have time for one more, and we need to be brief, the lady in the blue there. big question we have a minute for oh, a response <laughs> uh, a compre I, I, let me let me uh, just uh, clarify I think a comprehensive high school the idea it being that it, it provides the full array of courses just like our you know Washington Lee and Yorktown and Wakefield have as well as sports opportunities band uh, theater program I mean, we have a variety of options at our comprehensive high schools we also have some options at our programs and um, right now, first, I guess, to answer your question, the 1,300 seats, we haven't fully defined them at the moment. So that, um, if you look in your bond packet, the planning for that, uh, what's, what that's going to be, is part of what we're funding now as we get started thinking about what it could be. We have, as, as I tried to point out in my comments, a wide array of students and array of interests. Um, many students want to play on the soccer team. They want to play on the lacrosse team. There are a large number of students, and be in the marching band, and all sorts of things we can define. There are a large number of students who don't necessarily want to do that, um, and we want, but we absolutely want to make sure that they're all getting to do what they do want to do. One of the things we just did this year, I'm very proud of, is that we added a new sport, ultimate frisbee. That is available at every comprehensive high school, but it's also going to be available at every program. And as we build our programs, Arlington Tech is growing as we speak. We're going to be talking and thinking about what are they missing? What do those students need to, you know, to have opportunities to do? Do they should they have a full array of sports? Should they have other artistic opportunities? These are all things that are still we have the time and we will be and very much the will um, to be planning for those things and talking about them. So whatever those 1,300 seats are. We're going to have enough seats across the system that are going to provide the right array for the different kids we have. Thank you. Since I promised we'd have you out for the debate, that unfortunately is all the time we have. A bunch of thank yous before we go. Thank you to Patrick Murphy, Barbara Cannon, and Chris for presenting. Thank you to the AM team, the uh, services team here at Merriman. Thank you to Sharon Dorsey for putting this together on our program committee led by Ed Nolan and Patrick Hope. 9th of November, day after the election, we are back. The topic will be, what did it all mean for Arlington? We'll have representatives from the four major parties here. Please be safe. Look forward to seeing you all the 9th of November. <laughs>